Good evening, Bulls fans. This is Matt Gritzmacher from UBBullRun.com. I am not joined by John McWinney tonight. Usually I say, as always, I'm joined by John McWinney. Um, John is an Arizona Cardinals fan, and as such, both went to the Bills game today and also isn't on the show tonight. So I can't say, as always, and maybe I can't say, as always, in the future, uh, which is a bummer. We'll see how I feel next week. But this is the Olympic Rundown from uh, Blue Bowl TV is what we call it. Uh, John and I write for UBBullRun.com. As you know, that's almost certainly how you're finding us. But if not, go find more of our stuff there. Uh, the Olympic Rundown covers all the other UB sports outside of football, which had a good weekend in their own right, and basketball, which is a couple weeks away from, from getting going. Um, really tough week for UB athletics <laughs> on the Olympic side of things, you know. Um, Rowing got their season started, so we'll talk about them first. Um, three soccer games between the two, uh, between the two soccer teams, and collectively zero goals and three losses. Um, that's a bummer to say the least. Um, did we cover? Maybe it's four soccer games, and we beat No Bonaventure was last week. All right, it's uh, it's three soccer games, and a bunch of shutouts. Um, Volleyball played better, but still was swept twice in their opening MAC weekend against Kent State and Ohio. Um, cross country's off. Men's and women's tennis had strong weekends. They're they're the highlight of the weekend for sure, especially women's tennis. Um, I think the men faced tougher competition, splitting their team between Binghamton and Princeton, but the women hosted their own UB Invitational. They do every year, and really dominated. I don't think against particularly impressive competition, but wins are wins. Um, and I think each of the last couple of years, UB's used strong falls to build on and have a, have a spring that improved over the last year. And so I'm really hoping for big things from women's tennis uh, over the spring. And, um, you know, this is the type of showing that regardless of competition shows that it could be possible. Um, so we'll get to them in time. Um, without John, I'm going to be a little bit more delayed and confused. Oh, Bonaventure was since the last time we talked. I can not keep track of days. Well, then we have a soccer win to talk about, so that's nice. Um, kind of. We'll start with rowing, though. Rowing opened their season, so we'll go with them first. They don't, they don't do much in the fall. They are mostly a spring sport. Only, th I think, three races total in the fall. But they did open up with just a quick little go against uh, Canisius, and DeUville had a boat uh, in here in western New York. I shouldn't say here in Western New York. There in Western New York, where UB is based, not where I'm based, um, and raced and got you know got their boat in the water and see what happens. Um, pretty similar to last year, where Canisius was generally faster, not wildly faster, but Canisius had the better of the day um, in Varsity Eight. Uh, Canisius's first boat ran away with it pretty good, and Buffalo's first boat was five seconds behind Canisius's second. Um, in the varsity four, Canisius took the top two spots and the fourth spot. Um, UB was less than 10 seconds from, from winning the varsity four race. Um, and then their second and third boats were, were less than a half minute off of, um, Canisius' third boat. So we'll see with time what that means, uh, how it pulls things together. Um, I'm still trying to find a way to talk about rowing with more substance um, and it hasn't come to me yet. So I'll get there eventually. We'll figure out what to say. So that's rowing. Hooray, you've opened your season. You've added another team to our list. Um, men's soccer. We'll move on to men's soccer. Uh, I think that John would have a good amount to say about men's soccer. I have I have a good amount, but to quickly say, you know, when we talked last week, they had lost 3 nothing uh, at South Florida. It was their first loss of the season. It's kind of, you know, the team's not great in the heat. The team, you know, probably toughest toughest match on their schedule uh, before – absolutely the toughest match on their schedule before MAC play, before Akron in a little – in two weeks. Um, wasn't too upset about that South Florida match. Since then, starting to think of the South Florida match has kicked off a pattern of some sorts. It's hard to know what's going on, but definitely a, a lackluster week since then. They did beat Bonaventure 2-1. They had a one nothing lead in the first half, scored right out of the gate in the second half, seeded a goal, but were able to hold on for the 2-1 win. Um, and then they went to Binghamton and just got spanked uh, all over the place, lost 3-0 to Binghamton, which is um, surprising to say the least. 
you know, I think a week ago I was talking about this team being in contention for an at-large bid, even if they couldn't knock off Akron. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe they make it, you know, maybe they draw Akron, you know, once and lose them once and somehow, you know, make it to the MAC final and hit the end of the year with only three losses and maybe that's still in play. But, uh, you know, the way this week went, it's a lot harder to think that way. And it's now we're kind of hoping for something to turn around. So that 3-0 loss I didn't have video of. But the Bonaventure game, UB really lost their composure in the second half. Um, Ryan Pereira got his first goal of his career early in the second half, and it looked like UB was off to the races. Last year against St. Bonaventure, they were 0-0 at halftime and ended up scoring six in the second half. And that's what I thought was happening. Um, some stuff happened, you know, uh, Cicerone got a yellow card for, you know, he must have said something real bad to the ref because all they were doing was talking as, as Cicerone was walking around and he got a yellow. And the second half just kind of devolved into a chippy game. UB wasn't playing their game. UB seemed distracted. Stu Riddle talked about it in the post game. He said they allowed outside influences to affect them. It just, it wasn't their game, but it was a win. And they kept the Big Four shield, which I should have mentioned at the top of the show. They keep the Big Four shield for another year, having gone undefeated against Canisius, Niagara, and St. Bonaventure this year. So that is absolutely a positive. But that Bonaventure game wasn't wasn't their game. Then they went to Binghamton, um, and really not much went right against Binghamton. They gave up two first-half goals, uh, one of them very quickly in the first half, first 20 minutes. Um and really couldn't muster anything until the final 10 or 15 minutes of the game and ended up losing 3 nothing, which is a surprising result in a number of ways. First, it's against Binghamton. Um, that's always surprising when we lose to them. Um, second, you know, it's after, not giving, after only giving up one goal uh, in the first month of the season, they've now given up seven in the last three games. That, that's very surprising. And they just, again, I, I could not get the America East feed to work, but they weren't playing their game. They weren't dictating pace like they're usually able. Um, something was just off. You know, Braden Scales was sitting out the game. He had picked up a red card late in that second half that really I can't overstate how out of character that second half was. But Braden, Braden Scales couldn't play against Binghamton. And if he's if he's the linchpin and he means that much to the team, then great. Then at least it's an easy solution for them to get back uh, the, the end of this week against Duquesne and fix things. Um so, you know, if that's it, that's it, great. But uh, we've gone in the span of a week from this team is rolling. You know, they definitely haven't faced too tough of a schedule, but they look like a strong team. They look like they've improved over last year, and Akron has had their stumbles. Let's see what we can do in MAC play. To all that's still there, you know, you don't, you don't win seven straight to start the season uh, without being a good team to have all those pieces there. But in the last week, it's been a very, very tough sledding for the Bulls, and They've basically got one game in two weeks to to bring it back before Mac play. As part of it is it's not just Akron, you know. Um, I've talked about Akron a lot because they're there and we challenged them last year. But Western Michigan and Bowling Green and West Virginia all look very good this year. I don't think any of them are better than UB when UB is playing well. Soccer can be fluky. We'll talk about the women in a minute. The women gave up a pair – of early goals this weekend and the other teams were able to hunker down and UB wasn't able to do much. And that can happen in soccer. It doesn't take much to swing the momentum of a whole game. Um, and while 90 minutes is a long time, it's also absolutely possible for a completely overmatched team to hold down for 90 minutes And West Virginia, Western Michigan and Bowling Green will not be completely overmatched against Buffalo. They, I think UB is better, but they won't be completely overmatched. And so it's not just Akron and the Bulls really have to, you know, if they want to repeat last year or look like they've improved over last year, they've got to figure it out based on, you know, the last week can't be what the season is now. And it's not what this team is. It's just, you know, what it what what's happened in the last week. And I don't know what the solution is because I only had a video feed for one of these three games. Um, but hopefully Duquesne is a nice step forward back on track. Um, that's this coming Friday or Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Um Whenever we do the show next week, it might not be Sunday night. Hopefully, we'll have good things to say about Duquesne. Um, Cicerone did factor into both UB goals on the weekend or the week with a goal against Bonaventure and assist on Pereira's goal. He's, you know, got 11 on the year uh, in goals, and he's up to seven, I think seven, eight, 
uh, assists on the year. Um, he keeps chugging along, but would have been useful to have him. I think with, I think he only picked up his second shot of the game, let alone any shots on goal against Binghamton in like the 73rd or 75th minute. You know, it again, didn't have a live feed that wasn't working for me, but um, he wasn't at least on the things that are documented in, in a box score and in a live stats feed. He wasn't the force on the field that he can be. So pretty sobering weekend from men's soccer. Um, we'll see what they got. One more match before before Mac play. Let's see if that's a turnaround. If not, hopefully they get, get up and really bring their best to Akron when they open Mac play. Uh, similar story, if a little less surprising, from women's soccer. Uh, really tough weekend. We knew this going into the weekend, going on the road to Ball State and Miami. Um, Ball State and Miami have both joined Buffalo and Western Michigan the last couple of years at the top of the conference. Um, and neither is really at the top of the conference now, but both are still good teams uh, with a lot of experience and good coaches. Um, the women went traveling and lost one nothing to both. They seeded a goal in each game before 15 minutes had passed and weren't able to break through uh, the defenses. And that said, the games were kind of different in that the Ball State game was as lopsided as a one nothing game can be. I think UB was outshot 20-1. to uh, the only goal, the only shot coming from Dana Lytle. Uh, Laura Dougal had to make seven or eight saves in that game just to keep Buffalo, you know, give him a shot. Coach Burke talked after the game about, uh, he said, you know, we were completely outcoached. We were completely outclassed. We need to prepare better. Um, wasn't able to watch that one, but about as ugly as a one nothing game can get. Miami's game, I think UB was more on the, on the front foot in this game, but they played, given up that early goal, really played in how Miami is winning this year. Miami's got an upperclassman goaltender in Vic Maniachi, and they are content to give up a lot of shots on goal and ask her to make a lot of saves. And they're content to force themselves to capitalize on however few chances they get uh, and gut out very low scoring, very defensive games. They got a goal 12 minutes in. Uh, Laura Dougal only made one save the whole game other than that, other than that shot on net. And um, Vic Maniachi made seven saves. UB out cornered, uh, Miami, something like it was 16 corners for UB, and I think I think six for Miami might have been nine. I wrote it up earlier today. Um, just a game that really you give up that early goal and you've played into Miami's hands. Um, in in their separate vacuums, neither result is that surprising. You go on the road to Ball State, not too surprised by one nothing loss. Going on the road to Miami, not too surprised by one nothing loss. It has been, you know, two weeks now since UB scored a goal. Uh, going back to that two through that two nothing loss to Syracuse, and this is a team that that I think I don't think they necessarily need to gel. I think they just need to play their best soccer more more. Um, you know, coming into conference play, their three losses were Syracuse, Hofstra, and West Virginia. No shame in losing to any of those, but they also got ties against Brown and Binghamton that probably should have been wins. Um, John and I have talked plenty about how that we haven't yet seen too much of an offensive threat from anyone but Chris and McCatrona. Obviously, with three straight shutouts, we haven't seen much of an offensive threat, period. Um, this is still a good team, even with two consecutive losses. That said, they're coming home for three straight home games in the next, um, you know, over the course of seven days, basically starting on Friday. And those are, those are really important games. Bowling Green, Toledo, and Ohio are absolutely all beatable teams. Um, I think that Bowling Green and Toledo have improved over where they were the last couple of years, but I think they're beatable teams. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll have streams. We'll have streams for all of those because they're all home games. And we see, you know, we see some something that's gelled. We've seen, you know, maybe a little bit more work of Julia Benati on the ball, maybe a little bit more work. Uh, you know, someone other than Chris McCatrona stepping up and drawing defenders. Um, if nothing else, hopefully we'll see some goals. It's less of a surprising kind of mid-season swoon for the women than what we're seeing from the men. But it's definitely, a, you know, just a bummer to have two one nothing losses. One in a game where UB really was lucky to only give up one goal, and one in a game where, you know, if, if that game is scoreless till 60 minutes in, maybe UB's got a little bit more momentum. But you give Miami the chance to bunker down uh, and just play their defense and rely on Maniachi which is what I'm guessing Miami did, given kind of the stats. It's going to be tough to break through that team that they've put together this year. So I had forgotten about the Bonaventure game at the top of the show, but but four soccer games this week and only you know two goals and really 
only one good half among those four games. Um, you know, collectively they're riding a, a five game losing streak. Um, we'll see what happens next week. Hopefully next week we'll have better things to talk about. The men are up against Duquesne on the road at Pittsburgh. The women have a pair of home games uh, against Bowling Green and Toledo. Hopefully those are, you know, winnable games there. We'll definitely have more to talk about. John, I hope we'll be able to attend those games and talk a bit and we'll see, we'll see where we go from there. Um, another team, another pair of losses, opening Mac play volleyball, you know, lost three, nothing to Kent lost three, nothing to Ohio. That said, I'm pretty happy with both of those matches considering where, um, where the team has been this season, uh, especially against Ohio. You know, I, I'll get back to Kent in a minute. But against Ohio, UB lost 22-25, 17-25, 22-25 in those three sets. But they had their highest hitting percentage of the season, uh, hitting 228. They had, you know, reasonable service. You know, they, they didn't have too many errors in, in serving. Uh, they capitalized, you know, enough on Ohio errors. They probably were a bit unlucky to lose that first set uh, and otherwise – they played well. They, they put together numbers. They, for both these games, Kent State and Ohio, they've had pretty balanced attack. Megan Warnett has absolutely, to the extent that we were already very high on Megan Warnett, uh, these two games have been absolutely stellar from her. She had nine kills on 10 swings against Ohio and against Kent State. Oh, that is still rowing. Um, against Kent State, she had eight kills on 16 swings. So she's got 17 kills on no errors over the weekend. She's really... She's really had a strong weekend, and I wouldn't say that, you know, the, the only one glaring spot against Ohio was that Ohio had 13 aces, which is uh, a lot. Um, and that feels like the one glaring weakness for UB is serve-receive. It's been an error, error, area of need for all of UB's uh, time under Blair Brown Lipsitz. That said, nowhere else was anything that bad. UB's blocking has really improved. They had 10 blocks against Ohio and I believe 11 against Kent State. Um, you know, their, their blocking has improved. They're seeing a more balanced attack. Uh, Valicia Watkins has kind of taken a step back in the offense. We're seeing more Madison Clark, uh, Rachel Sanks, more moving inside to uh, Megan Warnett. Uh, Cassie Shadow is starting to play like the player we expected her to be. At the beginning of the season, the team is improving. They're playing better volleyball. They're definitely playing more consistent. If you look at both the Ohio and the Kent State matches, you know, um, UB hit well over 200 for the final two sets against Kent State and hit about 250 for the first two sets against Ohio. And that's stretches that we just didn't see through the first couple weekends of the season. We'd see a strong stretch for six points and then a bad stretch for 10 points. Um, and now we're starting to see good play last for an entire set. Uh, the trouble just is so far, they've run into teams that are just better than them. And that in its own right is something that I don't necessarily want to be complacent about, but simply being playing well and getting beat by a better team feels a lot better than playing incredibly inconsistent and not even being able to string together focused play for, for a whole set. So uh, they're also like women's soccer 0-2, on, on the Mac season. I do think that we're starting to see the lineup whittle down a bit. That's probably part of it as well. Since Wernett's got Wernett's gotten better as Christina Kirsten has played less. Um, we're seeing Madison Clark play more of a role in the offense. Scout McLaren is Scout McLaren. Uh, Maddie Torbeck had missed some time and came back and played, uh, you know, this weekend. Um, you know, I, I just think we're starting to see things stabilize a bit for, for volleyball and hopefully that'll continue. They are this weekend at Akron and versus Ball State. I um, should know how those teams are doing this year, but the reality is that I don't think any concerns about matchup really matter until we see a match where UB plays their best volleyball for the entire match. Um, so they're at Akron and then have their home opener versus Ball State Saturday, October 1st. That is going to be a busy day. I'll say that now. That Saturday, October 1st is a busy day. Um, you know, we'll see. I, I definitely think that UB improved, even from the win over Bucknell, 
to Kent State. I was happy with their Kent State performance. And then they were very clearly improved from Kent State to Ohio the next night. Um, we'll just see. I wouldn't say that I've, I'm satisfied at the moment, but I do think that much like softball's arc over the last uh, two seasons, I feel like the same issues are at play, but they're becoming slightly less of issues, you know, and, and it's not a big step forward in improvement. It's not, you know, women's soccer switching coaches and immediately going undefeated in the MAC, but we're, we're seeing something. And if everyone on this team, you know, gels, if they stay together, you know, they, if Coach Lipsitz holds people together for next year, this year will be beneficial. Uh, we've definitely seen improvement over the first month of the season. Hasn't been enough to win matches or really win sets yet, but I do think there's improvement there. So they're at Akron and then hosting Ball State next weekend. Hopefully we'll get some some bounce from them. Um, I did mention softball in the post, a little bit of news from softball. Obviously, they, I guess they played fall exhibition games, but I don't spend the time investigating those. I've got to be quite honest. Um, softball, Katie Weimer, who was an absolute star standout, looked on pace to break every UB offensive record in the book after her freshman year uh, has transferred to Tennessee. That's a huge bummer. Uh, Courtney Gilbert has also transferred out uh, earlier in the, in the fall. She transferred to Detroit. Um, that is, to me, a red flag for softball. Anytime you have players who play very well, um, I thought that softball was somewhat on the way up after retooling following the senior heavy group that Trina Peel stepped into. Um, and we'll see what happens. It's, it's a long way out. But uh, Weimer had a great year, Gilbert certainly played below what her capability was. It is still a player with a ton of promise, could represent Canada internationally on the senior level in the future. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a red flag. I know that some will say that if you're Weimer and you had a year like you had, why not go to the SEC and see what you can do? But you're seeing in volleyball what happens when you can't maintain your roster and build on one year into the next year. Um, and I worry that that's something that's happening to softball. I don't. I think it's too late for other folks to transfer, but you you never like seeing someone very very good transfer out of the program because there's someone who, as fans, we were counting on uh, to kind of be the face of the program through this period of expected improvement. All that disappointing stuff aside, soccer, two soccer teams, volleyball, a little bit of softball disappointment. Um, both tennis teams were in action this weekend, and they were great. Let's let's just put it that way. Um, men's tennis split their team between Binghamton and Princeton for two invitationals they've taken part in the past, the Binghamton Invitational and the Princeton Ivy Plus Invitational. Um, and I'm really particularly interested in men's tennis this fall because there are so many newcomers there. I think something like the Binghamton Invitational is indicative of the type of competition they'll see in the spring. Um, in, on one hand, of course, the Ivy Plus Invitational is indicative of the, the tougher things you'll see in the spring. But this fall really is, is critical for us to get to know men's tennis and see what we can expect from there. And I was really pleasantly surprised to see that, um, you know, UB got two, two bracket championships, flight championships in Binghamton. Uh, Wilhelm Friedel, uh won, won his bracket, won two matches on Friday, one on Saturday, one this morning. Hao Shang Koi from also a freshman, also a newer new guy uh, from Malaysia. I think John and I had to look that up earlier in the in the month. Um, also won his uh, his bracket. He did not drop a set on the weekend, so that's great. So two new names, two really strong weekends in singles play, running through their brackets, winning a championship in Binghamton. Um, I'm not quite sure. We haven't yet seen the whole men's team all in one place. Uh, for me to draw anything about doubles pairings, and I doubt that doubles pairings are set yet. But for what it was, Natolo and Koi were 2-1 and one, uh, in their doubles draw, and uh, Fridel paired up with Constantino Sakiris, uh, and they, were, they, were, they won two matches in the consolation bracket after dropping their first in doubles. So that's in Binghamton. Um, Coach Nichol is really happy with the young guys. Um, they've got three weeks off now before... I think ITAs are in three weeks, and then the MAC Invitational that Western Michigan hosts is after that. Um, 
In Princeton, UB only sent two guys to Princeton, Philip Gerbic and Peter Vodak, Vodak both newer. Um, they, of course, paired up uh, in doubles, uh, you know, winning, winning one match in doubles, and I think Vodak was one and one in, um, in singles there. And it's just good to see them go, let's get some new guys and get them against tougher competition like they'll see at Princeton at the Ivy Plus Invitational because UB does play some pretty tough competition in the spring. Um, th we're going to be playing teams like Princeton and Cornell and Dartmouth in the spring. We do every year. Uh, it always feels like how, how our year goes depends on how we make it through that tough month where we play five of those teams in six weeks. Um, it's just good to see I am interested, you know, it's the fall. If someone's hurt or taking time off, that's fine. But I am interested in that. We only actually saw six six guys in action this weekend. Uh, Tony Miller, we know what Tony Miller brings. He's a senior. He's a captain. That's going to be good. Uh, but Vidit Vigela is a transfer, transfer in and not entirely sure. I don't think we've seen him yet this year. Uh, if we have, I apologize. I didn't do the research that I should have from two shows ago. Um, Interesting to me that it, it, we haven't seen those two this weekend, even though, um, you know, we, we were splitting the roster. There was certainly room to fit other guys in. So pretty positive outing from men's tennis. Those, those two bracket championships from Binghamton are really encouraging from a pair of freshmen. Um, you know, tennis is really high on this freshman class, on this recruiting class um, that came together kind of late. Um, Really looking forward to seeing what they do this year, and I think anything they put together in the fall only adds the excitement in the spring. That said, women's tennis absolutely takes the cake uh, for the weekend highlights. They hosted their own invitational, as they've done a few years uh, in a row. They had four singles brackets, four singles flights, and two doubles flights in this invitational, and they claimed all four singles championships and one of the two doubles championships. In addition to that, had finalists, the losing finalists, the second place finishers in three of the singles flights and had the second place finisher in the uh, doubles flight that they did not win. So that's just an outstanding result. I uh, don't think that the competition was all that tough. Uh, there was Niagara, Toledo, and a WSU who, to be honest, I can't remember who they are. Let's see if I can pull them up quickly enough with a recap. Um, but as I said at the top of the show, if if UB's winning, UB's winning, and I'm happy with that regardless of the competition. There are a lot of times that we have easier competition and we don't win. Um, let me try to remember. They, they're not listing who they played. That's frustrating. Um If John was here, he could fill this space with talking. Oh, I don't know who that W was, that WSU, but that's okay. Um, I don't think it was the toughest competition, but it's good to see. Um, two people who I really want to highlight from this are um, Niagara transfer Haley Hollins, who's come into the team. She won the D flight uh, match. Uh, she had a win over Megan Miller from Toledo and a win over her teammate, Laura Holterbosch, who's some upper class experience and leadership uh, for the Bulls. I'm excited to see what Hollins can bring. Uh, I don't think anyone's cracking the top three. I think that's pretty well set with Tanya Stoyanovska, uh, Chantel Martinez Blanco, and Margarita Kotak. And then you add in Mercedes Lasada Rubio, and you've got a really strong top of the order. But I'm excited to see what Hollins can bring, both in depth in the singles and also if she can help out in doubles and keep everyone's legs fresh. So I was glad to see her put together uh, a bracket win there. And another new name that I'm very excited about is Amel Ababula from um, Romania, I think. I should know that. She um, also won her singles draw in the C flight, but she did so uh, also topping someone from Toledo and then topping Sanjana Sudhir who had a very strong freshman year, kind of, I, I guess I shouldn't say flew under the radar because we talked about her all the time, um, along with Losada Rubio and Martinez Blanco. But, you know, she beats San Jonas here in straight sets, 6-2, 6-2 in the Flight C Championship. Uh, I'm excited to see what she can bring. Maybe she 
you know, bumps up. Maybe she's a factor in doubles play. Uh, it really feels like UB has seven singles players who I'm very excited about. Of course, they only have six slots. Uh, so I'm really eager to see what happens with them. Um, in the other flights, in the B flight, uh, Mercedes Lasada Rubio took that flight, beating Vanessa Madrigal from this mysterious WSU. Margarita Kotak finished fifth, having lost to that Madrigal, and then winning two matches to, to close the weekend strong. Uh, Tanya Stoyanovska and Chantal Martinez Blanco faced off in the flight A with Martinez Blanco winning 6 2 6 2 in the championship. Um, I put it in the tennis recap, but I think all told, uh, in singles play, UB was something like 21 and 5. And three of those losses were against themselves. And one was Anna Savchenko, who's a name I didn't even mention yet, uh, apparently withdrew, uh, not sure at what point, uh, from her opening match on the weekend in flight C. So not a bad weekend at all on the single side. Um, on the double side, we saw Laura Holterbosch and Amel Ebabula teamed up. They lost their first match and then got a bye and then lost their second match. But uh, Margarita Kotak and Tanya Stoyanovska won the flight A in doubles um, without too much issue. First match 8-4, second match 8-3, third match 8-4. So that's that's with a couple breaks in each match. You know, probably, you know, they might have come from behind, but that's a pretty comfortable margin. And then in the B flight, uh, Losada Rubio paired up with Martinez Blanco. Um, and there were actually two magic goals from this mysterious WSU, presumably their sisters. And they won that championship uh, over Losada, Mar Mar Losada Rubio and Martinez Blanco. Um, uh, also in that flight was Haley Hollins and Sajana Sadir. They lost their first match, took advantage of a bye, and then won their second match to take fifth uh, in that bracket. It's, it's women's tennis' own invitational. It's three years running now. They've really capitalized on, on weak competition. But at the same time, it's, it's good to see them win. The women are traveling to Navy uh, either next weekend or in two weeks. I kind of hope it's two weeks because next weekend's already so busy. Um, they are traveling to Navy in two weeks uh, for Navy's Invitational. I don't know who all else is invited there. That said, um, women have a lot of depth. Women's tennis has a lot of depth. It's really exciting to see. You know, you heard me say... I feel like they've got seven singles players who I'm pretty excited about, only six slots. It'll be really great to see what they can put together. If someone, you know, multiple people might be playing only doubles and only singles, and that'll be great to see if they can pull together wins that way, then everyone will be fresher. I think I think women's tennis has a chance at being one of the more exciting teams uh, on the Bulls roster, uh, UB Athletics roster this year. They, you know... We're very excited about men's soccer. I still am, even though I'm waiting for them to figure out their solutions to this past week. I think women's tennis has a potential to be a very, very exciting team in the spring um, that we should keep our eye on in the fall and see how things shake out. So very strong weekend for them. Pro absolutely the highlight of the weekend. I'm very glad that we have a highlight on the weekend because from the Olympic sports, it, it was a tough one. Um, that said, that is what I say we, but it's only me. I appreciate if you watch this in the future uh, that you've sat through just me talking without any banter from John, any actual conversation, and just ongoing droning. Um, but that's what we've got. Next week, we should have John back. Next week might not be on Sunday. I can't remember when my plane lands. Uh, I'm going to Boston for the football game. Um, I think it lands in time for our regular, our regular show, but we'll see what happens. But next week, I should have John back. Next week, we should have some better results to talk about. I shouldn't say should, but I very much hope that we do. Uh, thanks for watching tonight. Go Bulls. We'll see you in a week. Have a good one.